This meeting is being recorded. Recording is progress. Am I being heard okay? Cool. Well, thank you. Um, good to see you all. Y'all, um, as, as they say in Washington. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks again for, uh, first of all, for coming to class, really appreciate it. It's so nice to talk in front of people. And thanks for uh, putting your camera again, appreciate seeing your puzzled faces. Um, it's, it's always nice uh, to know uh, when, uh, uh, when you don't understand what I'm talking about, which is, uh, which is probably most of the time, but it's still, it's pretty helpful. Um, yeah, so uh, should we start? Okay. Um, first, a couple of announcements. Uh, Ekin, um, homework has been already posted and it's due next week on Thursday or Tuesday. What, what's the cycle that we have? Uh, it's going to be next Tuesday. So now it'll be kind of back to the pre like the initial schedule. Yeah. Right, so two. Okay, so uh, lab two, we're gonna start soon. Uh, when are we gonna start that? I think TBD, but hopefully like within the next couple of weeks and I'll post the sign up soon, hopefully. Yeah, yeah we're, we're still working a little bit on it. We need to adopt some of the, uh, some of the material, but, um, but overall it looks good. It would be, pretty much covering imaging. So um, using the, the 3TG scanner and to kind of run sequences, uh, different parameters, what happens when you change your field of view, what happens when you change the resolution, how does that affect SNR, what happens when you run EPI, um, change the bandwidth, so you can kind of see all the shifts. So it should be a, a pretty fun, um, pretty fun, uh, um, uh, lab. Uh, we also experiment with T1 weighting, T2 weighting. Uh, we have a beautiful phantom that uh, Karthik, one of uh, uh, one of our students, um, uh, created. Actually, just paper came out uh, this uh, this month in MRM, uh, so you can check it out. It's a really nice phantom. It basically mimics uh, anatomy, so uh, it's it's a beautiful beautiful work. Um, so just a reminder, uh, don't forget. So the Midterm is this Friday, and it's pretty much just going to be a take home uh, on B courses. Um, you know, simple. You know, nothing, nothing new, and uh, we'll we'll cover pretty much chapter one to seven. So um, yeah, um, I mean, like every other work, um, you know, midterm is a piece of art, so it takes, you know, whatever comes out comes out. So. I don't think it's too difficult, but you know, who knows? I mean, Ekin, you took it, right? So, I mean, is it too difficult? I think it's pretty challenging, I would say, overall. Okay. So everyone well, should prepare well, yeah. Any questions? No joke, right? It's seriously happening. Yeah, I mean, what do you mean? Okay, thank you. Okay. Does it have anything uh, to do with April 1st? No, the midterm is April 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. Right, it's tomorrow. All right, moving on. So we talked about uh, image, uh, image contrast. Uh, last time, and basically, um, we you know, image is made out of you know, is a the what is the image that comes out is a contribution of many things, and we talked about it, and um, it's a contribution of both physical parameters, uh, for example, the proton density t1, t2 of the tissue, as well as instrumental parameter. What is the flip angle you're picking up? What is the repetition? What's the echo time? Uh, and so on and so forth. And it's uh, tissue is of course very complex. And so the result can be also uh, quite complex. Um, now, 
we didn't mention, I mean, we're going to focus on T1 and T2, but of course there's other sorts of mechanism like fusion. Um, there's, um, um, uh, give me some, I mean, I don't know, blood oxygenation flow, you know, there's just all sorts of uh, parameters that can actually, physical parameters that can cause, uh, that could cause image contrast. Um, but we mostly going to focus on T1, T2 because this is a major, uh, major Paul sequence is actually emphasizes T1 and T2. Um, while a lot of these things can be translated into other, other contrasts. And so one of the things that I'd like to cover uh, is, um, is kind of create the, I guess, um, like for you to understand kind of what are the knobs that can be changed in an MRI, and then how do you put, how do you emphasize this particular contrast that you want to see um, um, using changing those timings and in, in, in a in an imaging pulse sequence? Okay, uh, I you know I went over all of that, and we talked about gradient echo. We you talked about cervical, thoracic and lumbar T2 weighted fast spin echo, and spin echo, and so on and so forth, and the difference between them, and everything that I'm going to talk about is can be both related to spin echo and gradient echo, albeit whenever you have a spin echo, you have to understand that you have a 180 that can change a few, uh, a few things in terms of timing. For example, you cannot have a very short echo time uh, just because you have to put in the 180 there. And so there's gonna be consequences to that. Okay. Um, yeah, we did all that. And then we talked about the contrast. So image, it's basically MRI is just all about image consciousness. Do you hear all the kids screaming right now? A little bit? Yeah. It's not okay. that bad. Uh, they're just playing the Wii, Wii Sports, just, you know, down the door for me. It's like, ah, ah, ah. you know? So. I hope it's not too uh, disruptive. Um, you know, sometimes people also come in and out, go, out, go in and out this room. So hopefully it'll be okay. All right, um, so let's now focus right now um, on the gradient echo variations. And this is, um, so this is kind of evolution of slides I've made over the years. Um, and so, um, you know, kind of bear with me, but basically what are the knobs? I mean, we want to create differences in contrast, right? So this is a typical gradient echo sequence. Um, it starts by exciting. This is the excitation part. There's phasing code, a readout, and then time passes by and there's another excitation, phasing code, readout, and so on and so forth. So the question is, what are the knobs that you can change? Now, this, this, is, this is actually what MRI is so amazing, is that there's so many knobs that you can change. And each one of those knobs will end up with resulting in a completely different looking image. And that's just to me as miraculous. For example, if you would, um, unfortunately, let's say you, uh, you know, you still wanted to do medical imaging, uh, let's say like optics or something like that, or maybe x-ray, and you'd be really stuck with, um, let's just put more light in or let's, let's put less light in. You know, it's just like, there's just not much you could do in terms of getting contrast. But with MR, it's just so, vast and so uh, incredibly sensitive that even small changes can result in completely different looking images, which to me, it's still, um, it's still amazing. So let's, let's go over and try to figure out what are these knobs that we're talking about, okay? Um, so the first one is actually what you do here at the end. Uh, these are called spoiling, but like, I'm not going to spoil the surprise. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to spoil the surprise. Okay. Um, but the fact that, you know, if you do something here or you don't do something here, you can end up with, again, completely different images like those three. All these three images depend on exactly what is the thing I'm going to do here. Okay. So vastly different image contrast that can arise. What else? What can you vary here that might affect 
the image. We talked about last time, so just a review. Yes, Cindy, you want to say something? Oh, uh, RF flip angle? Oh, yeah, RF, right. So the RF flip angle, right. So RF flip angle, but actually just not, not necessarily just the flip angle. Um, flip angle is, you know, a quantity, but it could also have a phase because you can rotate, you apply the RF on, along the X axis, but you can also apply it on the Y axis, but you can also apply it on the arbitrary in between. And that's going to have maybe some implication uh, in, in, on image contrast. It's not trivial how that would apply, uh, but it could have something to do. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, okay, so that's, that's one. The other one, for example, is you know, the repetition time. If you repeat fast or repeat slow, you know, that's going to have an impact on image contrast. Um, the echo time, you know, how much time passes from the RF till you actually do perform the readout, that is going to have certain consequences on, um, on the image quality. For example, if let's say I excite and now I wait, you know, three, four minutes and then I do a readout, uh, I will get a phenomenal noisy image, right? Like basically I will get nothing because all the signal will have decayed by the time I would have acquired it. Okay, so that's definitely not a great image contrast, uh, but you can go anywhere between zero and three minutes and you see that somewhere there you will get an image and that image is gonna change. All right, so this is TR and echo time. And then finally, we could also, I mean, the magnetization here, uh, we always assume that it is, uh, you know, a line or like there's nothing before it. it's a line along MZ. And, um, and pretty much we start the sequence, but that actually doesn't have to be, we could also prepare by a series of sequences we, of RF pulses and so on and so forth. We can prepare the magnetization to reach a certain state that emphasizes certain parameters. And then we can perform also imaging after that. So that could, uh, that could actually make a big difference. And one of the examples here is fat suppression. So if we do no preparation, uh, we have the fat signal. These are, I mentioned before, were the kidneys. And then after the, um, after the fat suppression, then, um, you know, you could actually see a very different looking image. Uh, fat is, very, is usually very bright in T1 weighted uh, scans. So this is why the kidneys kind of look very dark. But now, oh, lo and behold, the kidneys look bright. And the reason is because there's no background because we killed fat. So it's a great way of, for example, you know, MR, you can use it to, you know, to get a diet, for example, right? Phenomenal. Uh, using fat suppression. Uh, I don't know why the vendors never emphasize this part about MR. I mean, because I think it's very useful. Definitely, if uh, you know, putting a few pounds. Right. All right. Hey, Mickey. Yep. What about um, the radiologists? They inject gadolinium, but do they have more than one kind of injection? Like, do they ever use something? other than gadolinium? Like are yeah, there multiple? Right. So, there's right, so there's different, uh, okay, so th these are actually different contrast mechanisms that you actually go and inject something into the person's body in order to, uh, to see something, right? So gadolinium has, is a T1 shortening agent. Um, and that's one example. There's actually different types of gadolinium even there, like how, how it's being chelated because gadolinium is a heavy metal. So you really don't wanna inject heavy metal into your body without it being uh, you know, chelated by some molecule that protects it and, um, uh, you know, and the, to let the ability to, for the body to actually uh, get rid of it. So um, I guess, do they have different a, contrasts? Do yeah, so there's a furamoxifil, for example, is another, um, is another contrast agent that is based on, um, uh, magnetic nanoparticles, okay, so iron uh, nanoparticles uh, that has a T2 star effect, a very strong T2 star effect. So it's a T2 star shortening agent. Uh, it actually affects both T2, T2 star, 
And as it turns out, also affects D1 sometimes. It depends on the concentration. So it's a, quite a complex uh, reaction. There's other uh, type of uh, molecules that people uh, also inject that, uh, for example, cess contrast agents, uh, which I'm not gonna talk about right now, uh, but basically they, it's uh, it's contrast agent that uh, the um, hydrogen or in in the body would exchange with these molecules, and so that would can cause some you know changes in signal. There's also carbon thirteen hyperpolarized carbon thirteen they could inject and see metabolism and so on and so forth. So there's uh, definitely a lot of uh, and people have looked at fluorine uh, type of um, contrast agent as well as xenon gas. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do now in this uh, lecture is to go over um, and try to analyze certain situations and what will be then the signal that comes out and to understand then how to emphasize certain parameters. In particular, we're gonna focus on T1 and T2, okay? So that's, and, and T2 star, of course, okay? You ready? This is gonna be like a, a water hose. You know, just, just open your mouth and, you know, and you're gonna swallow the whole thing. And uh, I hope uh, that some of the water actually ends up uh, within your body so we can image it. All right, so um, here's some, again, a new notation. We're gonna use M, X, Y, T as a function of time. And sometimes I'm just gonna use I as X and Y as the image, okay? Uh, or M, X, Y. Uh, M, M, X, Y is pretty much the image. It actually changes as a function of time. Uh, or that basically, sorry, it's the spin. The spin changes the function of time because we apply gradients, we apply RF, so the spin change is a function of time. I would be, I, X, Y would be the image that we actually collect, okay? So M, X, Y, T is, is the magnetization, and then I would be the image. Um, and we're gonna make an approximation. So when analyzing the image, we're gonna assume the magnetization at X and Y positions with time equals to T. So looking at the echo time, okay? Uh, because it's very complex and so we collect data while things are changing, uh, but um, yeah. Okay. Any, uh, any questions up to here? No question? All right. So we're going to consider a few situations. I mean, the first, the first thing that we actually considered in the past was that the TR was bigger, 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 bigger than T1. Right? In that case, magnetization uh, is fully recovered before the next excitation. But what we're going to do now is we'll consider slightly different situation where actually TR is less than T1, and but it's going to be bigger than T2. That means that before the next RF, um, the transverse magnetization have decayed. There's no transverse magnetization, but the longitudinal magnetization have not recovered fully, okay? And then later, we're also gonna look at the case where TR is less than, uh, than three, t three times T2, which is an approximation. That means that there is some persistent uh, magnetization geez, that, that's left over there, okay? All right. Question? Yeah. When you say T equals TE, which TE are you talking about? Because there's lots of them, right? No, echo time. So just uh, the echo time, we were gonna define in a, in a Cartesian sequence. So echo time, uh, echo time in a Cartesian sequence is, is well defined, right? It's, yeah, the, it's the, where you cross the center of case space. But there's lots of them, right? Because there's one for every phase. Yeah, but, but, 
Oh no, but but it's the same image that like of course the image doesn't change from phase encoded to phase encoded, right? Like the image itself doesn't change, but just encoded differently. Like we're not assuming a movie or you know, we're we're assuming a static image and they just keep on, you know, manipulating it and then reading it, but the, the image doesn't change. Does that make sense? Nikki, can you repeat? You said that there's no transverse magnetization left in this case. Is that correct? Yeah, we're going to assume that there's no transverse magnetization left before the next excitation. Okay. Because if there is, that is not a simple solution. If there isn't, it's really it makes it's much easier to analyze. But once you leave the transverse magnetization out there, oh boy. All right, that, that's where the magic happens. So we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, make so it, just, uh, yep. Sorry, I have a question. Go ahead. Just like, are you going to consider the case where TR is larger than T1 or the other way around? Um, I didn't really get what you said. Well, we're gonna assume, we're gonna look at all the cases. One, mm -hmm. that TR is larger than T1, then TR is less than T1, okay. um, and so on and so forth. So we're going to start going through all of these. OK, thanks. So just in terms of dynamic uh, dynamics, remember RF excitation, when you apply it, then you uh, pretty much uh, magnetization rotates from the longitudinal direction into the transverse plane. OK, so that's, that's one dynamic that happens. In free precession, that's gradient induced, uh, magnetization will then precess around the Z axis. And the precession frequency, of course, is going to depend on the how far you are from the center of the magnet, as well as what is the size of the gradients being applied. And then finally, relaxation, uh, you have two components. One is the longitudinal uh, component, which is like how fast the magnetization recovers. And then there's the transverse relaxation, which is pretty much how fast the transverse component decays. And those are not the same. Albeit, T2 is always, always less than T1. Okay. Now, it's a shame that that's the case, because if T2 was bigger than T1, then uh, in fact, that would be a fantastic way to generate magnetization. Okay. Imagine, uh, you know, the situation where you uh, flip. Right, and then let's say transverse magnetization doesn't decay, but longitudinal magnetization actually recovers. Right, sorry. Then, but longitudinal magnetization recovers, so the magnetization then ends up here, and then we excite again. So now our vector is over here. We excite again. Now, oh, it's going to lengthen our magnetization. Then it recovers. And then we're going to excite again. And then basically, we'll be able to create magnetization. So from an energy point of view, that's not going to work, unfortunately. OK, so T2 is always less than T1. So they are independent somehow. Even though we assume they're independent, they're dependent. Okay. All right. So here's the most basic sequence. And this sequence is called uh, saturation recovery. And the reason it's called saturation recovery, uh, yeah, well, what's the reason? Uh, that it saturates uh, M1, MZ. Right, so MZ, so the entire magnetization, uh, let's say it's in whatever, where it is, let's say in M, in M, uh, it's pointing in MZ, the entire magnetization, MZ magnetization, is going to be transferred completely into MXY. Okay. And then after that, the magnetization will then recover to some extent. And then we, again, whatever, whatever magnetization that's built up, you map it back into MXY. Okay. And then there's no MZ component again. And so basically, you're transferring uh, all the energy from MZ into MXY. Then things decay, rise, you know, recover somehow. That's the recovery part. And then you saturate again MZ by transferring all the energy into MXY and so on and so forth. Okay. This is called um, uh, saturation recovery. Now, um, 
basically it's a series of 90 degrees follow uh, like with a certain uh, time repetition. Now, if we look at a very long TR, so now TR is much, much bigger than T1, well, then that's pretty easy to analyze, right? Basically, MXY uh, decays completely before the next RF. MZ recovers fully before the next RF. So you got the full signal immediately after the RF. So your signal is just completely dominated by whatever proton density you're going to have, right? There's no T1 uh, dependency. Now, of course, if you wait before reading out a certain amount of time, then you are going to have some weighting associated with what parameter? With T2. Um, T1. What? T1, because of the 90 degrees pulses. I, I just said that there's no dependency on T1 whatsoever. Okay. Uh, but if you wait a little bit after the RF and then do the readout, you're going to, I mean, uh, who said T2? Oh, I said T2. T2 cool stops. Price. T2 stops. Ah, there you go. T2 star, because we're talking about gradient echo sequences, right? We're not talking about spin echo sequences. If it was spin echo, then you would be right. Okay. All right. So pretty much the dynamic is the following. You excite, and then uh, things recover, and then, uh, and this is what you get, right? This is, this is dynamic going on. Okay. All right. Okay. So now, um, now we're going to switch into um, into a situation. Now we're squeezing things in, and now our TR is on the order of T1, but much much bigger than T2. That means that MXY decays completely before the next RF, but then MZ partially recovers before the next RF. So the result of that is that you'll have some T1 weighting uh, in the signal after the RF. Why? Because it partially recovers. If it only partially recovers, well, if the T1 is short, it recovers more. If the T1 is long, it recovers less. So then there's just less magnetization for you to excite in the next uh, part. And so the dynamic is gonna be something more like that. Okay, uh, two species, each one with different T1s, will then uh, behave like this. So this would be kind of the steady state, right? You excite uh, and, then, um, and then they recover, right? Fully, uh, almost fully recover to some level. And so the level of magnetization that you're gonna get immediately after the RF is going to be dependent on T1. Okay. okay. So now let's actually go and analyze what is actually going on in a saturation recovery where the TR is of the order of T1. Okay, let's, let's start uh, and go and see kind of what's going on there. So first of all, uh, if I actually just look, you know, so I have M0. So this is my MZ and this is the magnitude of MXY. And I'm gonna try to then trace those and try to figure out what is this, what is the magnetization, like how it's actually um, evolving. Okay, so in the beginning, you know, nothing happened. So the magnetization is M0. And then suddenly we hit a 90. What would happen when you apply a 90? Think for yourself, Rizana. What happens to MZ? It goes to zero. What? It goes to zero. It goes to zero, that's right. And what happened to MXY? It gets, it goes to M naught. Yeah, it goes to M naught. Magnitude goes to M naught. Okay. Okay, but then after that, what would happen?
So this will go to zero. And then suddenly this will become M naught, right? And then what would happen now? What will and be the dynamic? Does MZ slowly recovers and MX1? Okay, so MZ will start recovering, right? It will start recovering. With what parameter? Um, T1. Yep. And what would happen to uh, M not, uh, to uh, MXY? It decays quickly. Yeah, it will decay. Uh, it will decay with what parameter? T2. T2 star. Right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So this is exactly what happens, right? So magnetization will then decay, uh, and then magnetization will start recovering. And it will recover up to a certain point, cannot be fully recovered because uh, before it has a chance to recover, then we're going to apply another 90. Okay. So in that case, um, you know, the question is, first of all, what will be then the magnetization uh, at this point? What will be the magnetization? It'll go back down to zero here. No, no, what, what, what will be the value actually? I mean, we can derive what it is, right? So it started at zero and then it recovers exponentially, right, right up to this time and like how long it took it, well, it's a TR. Okay, so we can actually write the expression Siri, shut up. Um, we can write the expression. We can write the expression. The expression is M0, one minus E to the minus TR over T1. Okay, that's the T1 recovery. Okay. How do I turn off this theory? Okay. All right. Um, so this, this is the magnetization just before the 90 degree. Okay. All right. Okay, great. Um, so what would happen now when I apply the 90? Magnetization will go to zero in terms of MZ. And then the entire magnetization here in MXY will then be exactly, this will transfer exactly to MXY, this expression. will transfer immediately to MXY and will end up with M0, one minus E to the minus TR over T1, okay, in MXY. So now the magnetization is going to be smaller, right? The first time we did it, the magnetization was M0. But then the second time that we excited, now the magnetization is actually M0, 1 minus E to the minus TR uh, over T1. Okay. So this is the magnetization that we get. Okay. Um, and so now um, things look similar, right? Like the next, so now uh, from here, the magnetization will then recover exactly the same way. Uh, we'll reach exactly the same point and then everything will transfer. So everything will be consistent and it will reach a steady state. So immediately after the first time, so uh, sorry, uh, immediately after the second time that we apply an A degree, then things will go back. It will go and reach a certain steady state. So I can basically, uh, things will come and will be exactly the same. 
So the, mag the MXY magnetization immediately after the 90 will always be M0, 1 minus E to the minus TR over T1, which basically gives us a T1 weighted signal. Okay. So pretty simple. Um, and then the first TR is usually not used because it's different. Okay, the magnetization is going to be different there. If you try to use it, use the phase encoder, you'll got inconsistency in the data that's going to result in an artifact because one phase encoder is going to produce a higher signal than the rest of them and it'll just be inconsistent. Okay, and this is not T1 weighted, whereas the rest are T1 weighted. So now we can start phasing code here, phasing code here, phasing code here, and just keep on going till we can construct an image because we get into a steady state. Okay, so let's do some analysis. The steady state signal is M0, one minus E to the minus dr over T1, okay? Now, what is the image? Well, if we look at an echo time zero, which is exactly immediately after the RF, okay, immediately after the RF, the intensity of the image is going to be some gain. I don't know what the gain is going to be. In fact, gain is something completely arbitrary. It depends on your system and ADC and like what is the gain of your amplifier and the sensitivity of your receiver coil and all that stuff. So there is some constant factor that we usually uh, don't know what it is, but it's just going to be some gain, okay? But it's going to be the same for all the phasing codes, okay? It's not going to change. It's also going to depend on rho xy, which is the spin density distribution, or uh, yeah, the spin density distribution within the image. And then um, you're going to have this component, which is minus, one minus e to the minus tr over t1, and this T1 is also a function of X and Y. So it varies for different spatial positions. Okay, so this is really the image that we're gonna get. Okay, and it of course is proportional to our magnetization. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Now, um, if, TR is much, much less than T1, okay? Um, here, TR is approximately, you know, appro I mean, this, this is actually valid for whatever T, uh, TR is, right? Like, uh, it doesn't matter. But when TR is actually very small uh, compared to T1, then we can make an approximation, pretty much a Taylor approximation. So approximately this uh, as TR over T1. Okay, that's, uh, if you actually look at one over this, when T1 is much uh, uh, much bigger than the TR, you can actually approximate it as this, okay? Um, and so this is a, this is a good, good rule of thumb to think of T as, uh, you know, my signal is gonna be proportional to TR over T1 when uh, TR is much, much shorter. Okay, it's just a, a, a linearization pretty much. This is the linearization of this. And the nice thing about it is that you, from here, it's very easy to see that short T1 will result in something that is bright, right? Because T1 is at the bottom. And then long T1 will of course be dark because then this ratio means that you take some value and divide by something that's big, then it's gonna be dark, okay? So in T1 weighted or in saturation recovery, Short T1 will result in a bright image or a bright pixel. And if you have a species which has long T1, it will result in a dark one. Okay, relative to each other. Does that make sense? Uh, the jump, by the way, from here, yeah. The jump from here to here is just a linear approximation when, uh, when T1 is much, much shorter than TR, yeah. When you say, uh... T E equals zero. I'm yep. thinking you mean to say little t equals zero, and down below you mean to say little t equals T E. Those, where's your little t here? I'm a little confused. There's there's no little t because we said when we were going to evaluate the image, we're going to evaluate at the echo time when we cross the center of K space. Okay. 
that mean what's what does it mean to say te equals zero that is a te so that that means that we we switch our gradient so fast immediately after the rf such that we collect the image like like we collect the data immediately after the rf with zero time after the rf then is there a not TE? physical oh. yeah t equals zero oh i see what you're saying okay Okay, so within the TR, how far? Like immediately after, okay? Without waiting. Okay. Now, if T is not equal to zero, that means that we wait after the RF, then our magnetization is gonna be proportional to K, some gain, rho, which is the proton density, and then one minus E minus TR over T1, which is the usual expression that we got here. But in addition to this, we're gonna get some T2 star waiting. So now our magnetization, because we are giving it time after the RF has time to decay. And of course this decay is going to be proportional to T2 star, okay? And if T equals zero, then this expression is one. So this is why we get, you know, this, okay? Any questions? Because now we're gonna start moving. All right, so this was the gradient echo version, but you can also do a spin echo version of the same thing. And the spin echo version of saturation recovery looks like this. You got a 90 and a 180. You wait to TR and then you apply a 90 and a 180. You wait, you know, and every TR you apply a 90, 180. Okay. So now the question is, what is the magnetization distribution after the 90. Well, that we know, magnetization goes to zero, MZ goes to zero, and then MXY goes to the maximum, right, to M zero. Um, I can actually draw that. And then, and then what happens after that? Actually, it's not, it's not completely trivial. What happens to MZ? MZ will start recovering, right? It will start recovering, but then you're gonna knock it with a 180. What happens when you knock it with 180? It flips side. Yeah, it's going to become negative. Whatever recovers becomes negative. And now it's going to recover again. Okay. So whatever recovery that happened here actually is going to be negated. All right. And then from here, you're going to have a recovery back to. Um, to whatever equilibrium is. So, um, and whenever it crosses again, kind of zero, that's approximately where it's gonna be the TE. It's not exactly actually. And often we call this actually a, um, like an MZ echo, but it's, I mean, it's kind of weird, but you can kind of think of it, right? Like a kind of like an MZ echo in some way. You know, when it crosses the center of K space, uh, not K space, but the center, like the zero magnetization, right? Uh, but that that is actually the time when um, the, approximately the time where uh, we, uh, we are also have the echo time because that's the time approximately from here to here. It's not exactly, Right, because the time to recover from here is not the same as the time of here, but if it's pretty short, then it is pretty pretty similar. Because you can approximate this is a linear and this is a linear, and then it works out. Okay. Okay, so this is the echo time. That's exactly the spacing from the 90 to 180. And this is the time where we were going to collect the data. 
And so the question is really, what is the magnetization, like the MXY magnetization at this point? And we'll, we're gonna look at it in a second. But then what happened to MZ? So you get to here, and then what happens now? What happens now? Uh, back to zero. Yeah, back to zero. And then recovers, flipped, recovers, right? So now we got kind of like an equilibrium situation, right? Like we got a, the, the usual steady state. And then in terms of, and in, in terms of the MXY component, so in terms of the MXY component, first of all, MXY will decay with T2 star over here, right? So the assumption would be, oh, you know, it decays pretty quickly with T2 star. And then just before the 180 refocusing happens, before the spin echo happens, suddenly the magnetization will uh, start building up at the same rate as T2 star, but up to a certain point and then decay again. And there is this, imaginary curve here of the actual T2 curve, right? Because it can only rise back to the actual T2. So this, well, I guess I actually drew this, so let me just delete all of those. Yeah. So the magnetization will drop and then start recovering back before the echo. Uh, and then at the, at the echo time is going to be the maximum. And the decay again is the envelope is T2 star. But then from here to this level, this is the actual kind of theoretical T2. So it can only, the, echo, the span echo can only rise up to the uh, T2 parameter, T2 decay. Does that, does that, make, does that make sense? Okay, so now we wanna develop also like what is the, um, what is actually the values there. And we're gonna make an assumption here. I'm gonna make an assumption that this time is much, much shorter than this time. It is so short that I can actually ignore it, okay? And because I can ignore it, I can just do develop pretty much assume that the magnetization just rises, you know, um, uh, that basically, uh, you know, just recovers the entire T, you know, TR, okay? If it's very short. If it's not short, well, then I have to take into account, you know, uh, TR minus TE, and then start building it up. It is possible. It just it makes the equation kind of not look nice. So if TE is much shorter than TR, I can ignore the fact that T is fast and assume that the entire recovery is the whole TR. Otherwise, this is gonna change to TR minus T. Okay, the recovery will change to TR minus T. Okay. So our signal is going to be some constant, constant proton density, T1 recovery, T1 recovery, and then some T2 decay that depends on the T, okay? And it's T2 decay, not T2 star, because we had a spin echo. This is a great sequence. It's a great sequence because now I can actually change some parameters and you can kind of see how I can emphasize different um, you know, properties of either rho, T1, or T2 based on the timing, okay? For example, if I just wanted to emphasize proton density and be completely independent of T1 and T2, I would wanna make the echo time very, very short if, if the TE is much, much shorter than T2, then nothing has decayed. 
And so this component over here is pretty much one. Does that make sense? Okay. If TR is very long, so compared to T1, then this is long compared to this. Well, then uh, the whole thing here is a very small number and the whole thing here is gonna be one. Okay, this will be zero when TR is very, very long compared to T1. And hence, uh, one minus zero would be just one. And so this component will go away. And this is really how you get a proton density image with a spin echo is that you um, just make TR very, very long, at least three times the longest T1 and TE as short as possible, such that there is no decay or very little decay. And that is the proton density. And you can kind of see how proton density imaging can be very expensive in terms of time. Okay. All right, well, now I just want to emphasize T1 weighting. If I want to emphasize T1 weighting, all I have to do is try to emphasize this component, right? And of course, it's going to be weighted by I mean, there's just no avoiding uh, be waiting by, uh, by the proton density, right? If there's no protons, then I'm, I'm screwed, right? So uh, when I say T1 weighting, it always comes with a weighting of proton density, okay? So I wanna emphasize this. If I wanna emphasize this, I want to de-emphasize this. De-emphasizing this means I still want to make a very short echo time. So TE, very short, much less than T2. TR should be then, at the order of T1, if it's in the order of T1, then there's gonna be some weighting associated with that. And so then my signal is going to be proportional to K rho one minus E minus TR over T1 like we did before. And just in an example, uh, if you wanna do a brain imaging uh, gray white matter, then you often pick up a TR of about 400 milliseconds. That's the order of T1 of gray white matter. And then echo time of 50 milliseconds, which is relatively short, uh, that's at 1.5 T uh, brain imaging to emphasize T1. Any questions? Well, I have a question. We just had a yeah. T1 waiting without a spin echo. Is there any reason to do a T1 waiting with a spin echo? Yeah, this is with a spin echo. Um, uh, the, the, it's okay to do it without a, T1, you can do with or without a spin echo. T2, you can't. If you wanted a pure T2. Okay. For T2 weighting, um, what you'd like to do, well, for T2 weighting, um, I would like to de emphasize this and emphasize this. If I want to de emphasize this, what does that mean? You need it, Anita. Well, I'm gonna make TR to be very long, much longer than T1, okay? At least three times longer than the longest T1. And then I'm gonna make my echo time approximately around the T2 that I'm interested in, right? And so then my signal is going to be proportional to K rho x, y, sorry about that. E minus T over T2, okay? So I will get pretty much T2 weighting. And an example for that is TR of 2,500 milliseconds. That's 2.5 seconds, okay? TE of about 80 milliseconds, okay? So now it's relatively long. And that again for brain at 1.5 T. Why do you need TR to be so long? Well, that's pretty much because of CSF. CSF has a very long T1, so we really need to make TR very, very long. So again, like proton density, T2 and proton density can be very, very long because you have to wait so long until the magnetization recovers, so you eliminate waiting, uh, T1 waiting. Okay, 
these two are pretty expensive. Proton density and T2 are very are pretty expensive. If you want to image a single slice, if you want to image multi-slice, you can kind of interleave things like we showed before, right? You can excite one slice and then excite the other one and excite another one uh, in between. So that allows you to uh, make things more efficient. But if you wanted to do a 3D sequence, that is a problem because you excite the entire magnetization. Well, now you have a chance to a very short time window to acquire, let's say one phasing code. And now you have to just pretty much wait for a very long time, like two and a half seconds. And then you do it again. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All right. So now I want to talk about the uh, um, the case of uh, general excitation recovery. So I talked about saturation recovery. Saturation recovery is a 90, 90, 90, 90, but I don't have to do a 90. I can actually do a theta, 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 and that theta doesn't have to be a 90, okay? So the question is what would happen in this case and how we would go about analyzing the situation? So obviously, um, you know, just because of physics, it has to be a steady state. Like if I just do theta, 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 I mean, it has to end up with a steady state. Otherwise, it, like it doesn't, and this is not a chaotic system, right? Like it cannot happen. So that means that um, what I want to do is to be able to analyze kind of what is going on. Like there is going to be a steady state in which, you know, the amount of magnetization that recovers over here, and then I convert it to MXY, well, then whatever arises here are going to end up exactly at the same point over here, right? This would be the steady state. I mean, in the beginning, maybe they're not be a steady state, but eventually it will end up being a steady state, okay? Uh, the steady state for a 90 degree happened immediately, like after this, you know, the first excitation the second one is already the same steady state, but for an arbitrary flip angle, it may not be the case. Okay, but what happens in the steady state? How do we gonna be the analysis? Well, what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, try to uh, figure out um, you know, uh, like what is, you know, what is the magnetization MZ plus such that when it recovers with T1 over a TR ends up being MZ minus such that it, that after you apply a theta, that will be equal to MZ plus. Okay. That's, that's what we're going to derive and try to figure out what, what is going on. And then, uh, of course the, whatever magnetization here is being generated in MXY then that is going to decay with T2 star. Okay. So let's go through this analysis and please bear with me, okay? Um, lots of handwriting here. I'm just gonna go very slowly. I could have went and derived it right now, but like I'm not in a uh, mental situation to start thinking about it, if you don't mind being April 1st and so on and so forth. All right, so um, let first define the following just so it makes it easier. So that's a very common thing to do is define E minus TR over T1. We usually call it E1. And by the way, how would you actually call E to the minus uh, T E over T2? You'll see that in a lot of papers, okay? A lot of papers, you know, you'll see this E1, this is E2, and kind of people know that. Um, okay, all right, so we're gonna define this. So the question is, what is MZ minus? Okay, let's go back. MZ minus is over here. Well, MZ minus is pretty much if you have MZ plus and it recovers with T1 over TR, it ends up being MZ minus. Okay. 
MZ plus will recover into MZ minus. Okay, so MZ minus equals MZ plus E minus TR over T1 plus one minus E minus TR over T1 times M zero. So um, it's, I think we derived that in the past, but um, just so you can see kind of that is uh, this, this equation kind of makes sense. Um, if TR was zero, then, um, then we ended up um, just being MZ. So if TR is zero, then there's no recovery, you get MZ plus. If TR is infinity, then you get full recovery to M zero. This component will go to one, this component will go to zero. Uh, and this is pretty much the equation that describes this exponential growth. Come on. Seriously? Ugh. You know, some people. Do you mind? All right. Thank you. All right. So, um, so this is the this is the recovery, and then we can just write it m z minus equal m z plus times e one plus m zero one minus e one. All right, just a uh, uh, simplicity. Okay. Now, that's not enough to really solve it. So if we actually go again, there's another relationship because we know that if this is MZ minus, right? Um, what will be then the value after applying a theta, um, a theta excitation? Okay, this is theta. What will be this value over here? Would it be mz minus cos and theta? Not minus, but yeah, mz minus times cos and theta, yeah. Can you sit down? Jeez. So annoying. I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry. All right. Um, okay, yeah, so this is exactly the case. So mz plus equals mz minus times cosine theta. Okay, so now we have two equations, two unknowns. And in the steady state, mz minus will be equal to mz. Um, yeah, so then I can uh, pretty much substitute them, right? So I have uh, I have this equation and then I have this equation. So I can substitute um, mz plus over here. And then in the steady state, I will go, I will get mz minus equals mz minus cosine theta e1 plus m0 one minus e1. And then I can kind of uh, move this component to the left side to get mz minus one minus cosine theta e1 that equals mz m0 one minus e1. And then uh, the result will be that mz minus equals m0 one minus e1 divided by one minus cosine theta e1. Okay. So this will be mz minus, okay? That's the steady state equation of mz minus. Now the question is, okay, so I know what mz minus is. Now I apply a theta and convert some of that mz minus into mxy. And so what will be then the mxy component? It will be mz minus times sine of theta. And so the result again is gonna take this component and say MXY plus immediately after the RF excitation will be M0 one minus E1 divided by one cosine theta uh, E1 times sine, sine of theta. Okay, and this is our steady state signal. 
This is the value of our magnetization in the general excitation recovery. Okay. And this is a very typical way that people analyze this type of sequences. Okay. You can throw in an inversion, you can throw in all that stuff. As long as there's no transverse component that's left, then you can perform this analysis that way. Okay, try to figure out kind of what happens, you know, track the recovery and so on and so forth and figure out what the steady state is and do this analysis. And at the end, just probably after whatever happens, you wanna see what MXY is, is pretty much MZ just before that, before the RF times sine, sine theta. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, so at an arbitrary echo time, I will get, you know, whatever I got before times e to the minus t e over t two star. Okay. Because of course the signal will decay. So if TE is very short, then you can ignore this and this is what you get. But if T is longer, then um, you, know, you have some T2 star waiting. And of course you can go ahead and derive the same, a similar thing, what happens with, uh, with a spin echo. Although for spin echo is a little bit more complicated because if once you have a small flip angle and you do a 180, then you know that flips the magnetization to negative, so it's like it's a mess. So you got to watch out there. Okay, so you're probably not going to get what you're thinking you're getting. So it's not trivial actually to translate that into a spinnaco sequence. And so now that's interesting. So this is our expression. And the question is really is there a theta that maximizes the signal? Because let's see what happens. If I would pick theta to be small, okay, let's see. If theta is small, then sine theta is very, very small, right? And so I will probably not going to get any signal. Okay, so my signal is going to be low. If this is, let's say, as close to zero, then I would pretty much not, I would get zero. Okay, so theta small, I get a small signal. What about theta being actually large, like a 90 degree? If theta is a 90 degree, well, in that case, um, what would happen there? Um, cos and theta, this would be, um, what is cosine of 90? Zero? So this would be one, right? Okay. Uh, and so you get kind of a significant uh, kind of winning. It's maybe it's hard to see, but you can actually plot this and you'll see that as it turns out that if you actually apply a very large data, uh, um, MZ is going to be small because it just doesn't have, you know, it does, it's not going to recover much, right? Like if, if theta is, is very large, then, you know, it takes time to MZ to recover. So if uh, TR is short and theta is large, then we're going to end up always just being very small signal. Does that make sense? Well, not really, because we just had a sequence with 90s, right? Yes, but 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 we looked at longer like TR and the order of T1. Okay. What if TR is very, very short? Okay. Let's look at that, right? Then in that case, you know, uh, if this was very, very short, then there's really not enough time for it to recover, right? So you can kind of think of a very long T1 or or very short or very long TR, right? Like you know, whatever. Pick pick your poison. Right? If TR, if T1, uh, if if this is long, then um, if this this time is long, then you know it could it could actually recover. But if it's very very short, there's not enough time to recover. So 
your signal is going to be also low. So really, when you have a very short TR, much, much shorter than, uh, uh, than T1, then you're going to have a problem because your signal is going to be low. Okay. So there's two cases here that are very interesting. One is that whenever theta is small, you get a small signal. When theta is large, you get a small signal. So there may be some optimum in between. And as it turns out, actually, that there is one, and that optimum is theta e, or Ernst angle, uh, which defines as the inverse cosine of e1. So that actually optimizes. You can actually go and you know, solve the derivative, find that, you know, find the maximum, and so on and so forth. You can go through all of that. And pretty much is the inverse cosine of e minus tr over t1. So if you want to maximize the signal for a particular T1 species, then you should pick a flip angle, which is the Ernst angle, that appropriate, not a zero and not a 90. It's somewhere in between. And it's called the Ernst angle after Ernst, uh, Nobel Prize laureate in uh, NMR. Right? Um, so here's an example. If TR equals to T1, then theta that you want to apply is 68.4, okay? That's, the, that's, that's, that's a, really good, a really good rule of thumb. If TR equals to T1, then this is the flip angle you need to apply in order to maximize your signal. The optimal value will then be M0, one minus E1, divided by one, one plus E1, square root of that. Again, comes out from the, from the derivation. If you substitute, that full angle into the previous equation. Now, this is an optimum signal, but it's not optimum contrast. If I'm also want to emphasize the image contrast between two species, that's not necessarily going to be the perfect angle. In that case, maybe there's another other angles that I want to apply. But if you just want to maximize the signal for a particular T1 species, then this is the one that you do. So let's say you're going to scan phantoms uh, and you want to uh, you know, do very fast scanning, you're limited by SNR, uh, then if you know the T1 of the phantom, then you should pick this flip angle uh, or a particular flip angle depending on your uh, TR, such that your signal is maximized so you, uh, you're not wasting uh, your time getting a suboptimal scan. Any questions? All right. So now I want to go and uh, just finish with inversion recovery. Okay. And inversion recovery, it's a sequence where we apply a 180 that would invert the magnetization. The magnetization then starts recovering with T1 up to a certain point. And then we apply a 90 degree uh, in order to image. So basically, uh, we invert. There is a time inversion, inversion time, TI. Then we apply a 90 degree. That's usually when we collect the data. And then we let the magnetization recover and then repeat the whole thing over and over again. Note that this is not a spin echo. A spin echo is the opposite thing, right? You start with 90 and then do a 180 that refocuses the magnetization. Here, we invert the magnetization first, and then we perform the imaging. This is not a spin echo that can be confusing sometimes. And uh, that, that's something to watch out tomorrow. So um, in the midterm, okay? So don't be confused between these two. Okay, um, so how do we go about again and try to derive what will be the steady state signal that comes here? Well, I mean, there's, there's a few things here that's going on, right? So first of all, at this point at four, the MZ is always zero, right? And four and eight, right? That, that, those situation, MZ is always zero. That's when we apply the 90. Immediately after the 90, MZ is zero. 
From there, it's easy to start deriving what's going on because now the magnetization just rises with T1. Okay. And so what we're going to do then is go like, okay, we're going to start here. It's going to, we're going to evaluate five. From five to six is very easy. It's just negative. And from six to seven, that's very similar to the case of the, uh, of the arbitrary flip angle, you know, the, the general saturation recovery, where you have some point that you start with, and then it recovers to some other point. Okay. So, Okay. All right. So let's, are you ready to do this? We have four minutes. We can do it. We can do it, right? We can do it. I know. All right, let's do it. So immediately after the 90, MZ equals zero. That, it's 0. 0.4. 0. 0.5, just T1 recovery. One minus E to the minus TR over T1. Uh, not TR, actually. Um, it's TR minus TI, right? Because the time to recover is TR minus time inversion. Okay. This time over here is TR minus TI. Okay. So at five, we get MZ equals one minus E minus TR minus TI divided by T1, all that times M0, okay? Now at six, six is the inverse of five. So you just put a negative sign to it. So distracting, distracting. Uh, so we just put a negative sign. All right, so now we go from here and we eval you know, we go up, up to seven. How long? T inversion, right? Okay, so at seven, we got MZ equals minus M0, one minus E minus TR minus TI over T1. You know, this is this component then that decays with minus ti over t1 and then plus one minus e minus ti over t1 all that times m0 again similar derivation like we did before for the uh, general saturation recovery always remember when you have a non-zero starting point you have one component that decays with t1 and another that grows up to m0 okay that's that's kind of how you decompose them, okay? All right, so this is our expression, and then we can kind of massage it, and so on and so forth, and then we end up with mz equals m0 times one minus two e minus ti over t1 plus e minus tr over t1. So we have a component that depends on inversion time and t1 and another component depending on TR over T1, okay? But this one is with the negative sign. Remember that we, when we didn't have the inversion, then we just had this one and this one, right? Without the inversion, we had this one and this one. Now we have the inversion. The inversion has a negative component, which is cool because I can actually pick a value here that the whole thing will become zero for a particular T1, right? So I could pick an inversion time such that a particular T1 will just be nulled. Okay, so the image at the echo time is that expression times E to minus T over T2 star, okay? And the advantages of this inversion and recovery is that it actually gives you greater T1 contrast. It turns out to be almost twice as the T1 contrast you can get from just saturation recovery, okay? 
um, just because of, uh, of this component that's being added. Okay, you can have much higher uh, T1 contrast. You can also null specific tissue, right? You can make this component such that the whole thing cancels. And so in the case of fat, the sequence, the timing called stir, if the inversion time is about 150 milliseconds for uh, 150 milliseconds at 1.5 T, then fat will null. If you want a fat, uh, you want to null CSF, that's called flare, fluid attenuated inversion recovery. And the T inversion time is about two seconds at 1.5 T. Now, why do I say at 1.5 T? What happens in 3T? T1 gets longer? Yeah, T1 gets longer. So T1 increases with, uh, with, uh, with field. Okay. So that's pretty cool. If you want to find what is actually the, uh, the null time, so you want to basically make the zero, so one minus two E minus TI over T1 plus E minus TR over T1 should be zero. And so the inversion time should be equal to minus T1 log of one plus E minus TR over T1 divided by two. Okay, that nulls it. So effectively, if you know the T1 of your tissue, you know the TR, that gives you the inversion time that you need in order to perform uh, a nullification of a particular tissue type, which I think we should uh, maybe uh, do in the, in the lab. We'll do like an inversion recovery sequence. What do you think, Eka? Yeah, I think so. Now, if TR again is very is much longer than T1, um, then you can actually approximate this to uh, T inversion being minus T1 log two. Okay, because this is uh, this is one uh, this uh, yeah this becomes zero. And so it's basically minus T1 log half, which is minus uh, T1 log two or something like that. Is that right? I think so. Anyway, it ends up being 0 0.693 uh, of T1. So when T, uh, you know, so it's a good, good, good rule of thumb. So uh, T1 of uh, fat is about 230, I think, at 1.5 T. So there you go. You know, something like that like ends up being in this value. So example of fat nulling, T1 of fat, actually it's 260. Uh, TR of 800 milliseconds at T1, uh, as 1.5 T, then uh, T inversion time will be about 168 milliseconds. And then you could, you know, translate that to any uh, anything, and that's pretty cool because that allows you then to have a really beautiful nullification of that. And then, I mean, there's going to have implication on the level of signals of other tissue, of course, but you have to be aware of. Now, I didn't mention this, but it is possible to actually have more than one inversion. You can have two inversions and three inversions. And when you add one or two or three inversions, then actually you can null more than one species. Uh, you can actually null two species uh, when you have two inversions. And there's a signal called MP2 rage, which nulls both CSF and white matter. And then you just end up with uh, gray matter or the opposite, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, let me just do five more minutes and I'll show you uh, some examples such that we're just focused a little bit. So here's an example of a T1 spin echo. Um, so here's on the left. Uh, let's see if we can see some parameters here. TE equals 15, TR equals 583. Okay, this is a 0.5 T system actually. Okay. Uh, there is a lesion over here. So you can kind of see that it has the same T1, very similar to gray matter. And so it's, it's kind of, you can see it, but it's, you know, it's not greatly seen, right? Like it's a, 
Uh, it's obvious because it's not symmetric, but it has the same similar T1 as, as gray matter, and that's why it looks like that. Okay, so this is a T1 spin echo. By the way, you see the parasitic? Like you see in the lab, yeah. Okay, the spin echo. Okay, um, now this is the T1 spin echo. Here is, again, it's a T2, it's this fast spin echo, but like just right now, just like imagine that it's similar to a spin echo, uh, to a spin echo, T2 spin echo. It's just more efficient. You acquire more than, you do more than um, one refocusing uh, pulses in order, to, um, in order to speed up the acquisition. But you see that the TE is 110 because we want to emphasize T2. So TE is very long. And then TR is six, Sec oh, is it like over six seconds, okay, for this particular case. So it's very, very long, okay? I don't know why they did it so long, but yeah, okay? So, um, and then here's the interesting thing is that now you start seeing, oh, there's actually some fluid or edema or something going on here actually in this, uh, uh, in this lesion. And now the lesion actually shows bright on T2, while on T1, it actually shows very similar to gray matter, but now, um, now it looks actually very different. Okay, so now you can kind of see this maybe tumor better, except that there's a lot of CSF, right? That is kind of obscuring that, right? Like this is, and it's very hard to see the boundaries of this tumor. You don't know if it's CSF or it's edema, what is it? Any suggestions how to improve it because of all the CSF? What we could do? Clear. What? Inversion. Uh, inf yeah, inver that's right. Flare. Right. Flare. Fluid attenuation, inversion, recover. Um, actually, let me just show you something uh, as well here. This is a two, T2 uh, fast spin echo. This is a T1 spin echo. Same slice. Um, here you don't really see anything, but on T2, turns out there's actually a minor stroke and there's edema over here because of the stroke. Okay, so there's, uh, there's inflammation in this, in this area and that changes actually T2 parameters while T1, it barely changes. I mean, barely see anything, but you can definitely see that on T2, except again, that it's very hard to distinguish this signal from the CSF, okay? So uh, what you could do then is apply T2 fluid suppress inversion recovery, echo time is 140, TR is 10 seconds. Wow, crazy, these folks are crazy. Did they put an inversion time here? Um, yeah, I don't see an inversion time. But it is a flare sequence. You see the flare sequence over here. Um, and now look at that. Wow, now you can see. Now, so it's definitely very different than the CSF. And now you can see very nice, bright. Uh, so the tumor is being emphasized. And you can kind of see, oh, yeah, so it's not just fluid. You know, it's just like you can say, oh, it's definitely edema over here. And what about the, uh, the, the stroke here? Look how beautiful it shows on flare. And that's because we removed all the nasty stuff, like all the CSF. So now it shows really nicely. Look how contrast is important. All right, it's T2-weighted flare. Now, of course, you can also do a contrast study. So this is when you inject gadolinium. Gadolinium um, goes into the blood vessels. And when you have a tumor, usually the blood-brain uh, blood barrier is, you know, has a, uh, it's leaky. And so the contrast agent actually leaks into the tumor. And so it's very easy then to see it. Okay. That's because, uh, um, and then anywhere else, you, the contrast agent actually doesn't penetrate, except that you can see it in the vessels. Okay. The vessels are becoming bright because of the contrast agent as well as the tumor. And then what about the edema also is being enhanced. Uh, that's because uh, those blood vessels here, because of the inflammation, again, that's leaky blood vessels. 
Um, and so some of the Galilini match the leaks over there. So you could see that as well. But pretty much this would be have been definite. Like you really didn't need that, right? So you don't need to inject anything. Okay, so this is just a regular T1, except that you inject contrast. And so here, because it's T1, then T, uh, TR is uh, 183.1. And then the echo time is 2.3 milliseconds, right? You don't want to have any T2 waiting. So your echo time is very, very short. Okay, so it kind of makes sense. All right. So what we're going to do then next week is we're going to look at short steady state imaging now where TR is much, much less than both T1 and T2 and see what happens. Okay. So that's going to be pretty cool with lots of like animation and fans and cones and pancakes and all kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, get uh, gets lots of, um, just stock yourself with popcorn already ready to see all the videos that I've made and uh, that I still for some of my colleagues, uh, I'll show you uh, on, uh, on uh, Tuesday. So uh, yeah, good luck to everybody tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah, have fun. We're gonna give you, we're gonna give you some, um, we're gonna see, give you some feedback uh, on on your proposals uh, over the over the coming weekend, okay? And so see what, what if there's anything that we want to comment, and then uh, try to meet with you next week uh, to see that everything's on track uh, for you to uh, finish your projects, which are expected soon. I have a 